Hey everybody, welcome back to Diesel Creek. My name's Matt. Behind me, this beautiful little blue beauty here is my 1964 CJ5. Now, if you haven't seen this little unit before, I actually rescued this thing from a barn. It had been sitting there for the Lord only knows how long, probably 30 years, I would guess. I'm actually only the second owner of this vehicle. When I got it, the engine was stuck. She had been sitting for quite some time and I was able to get the engine freed up. And in the previous videos, we got it running good enough to actually take it for a little drive. We ended up having to replace the head gasket on it. And in the last video, the radiator just came right apart at the end of the video. So in this video, I'm hoping that we can tackle the radiator. I've got a brake kit coming. We're gonna do the brakes. I got, and I believe after all that's said and done, this thing might actually be ready to head down the road. And uh, I'm really excited about that because spring is well underway here and it'll be summer before you know it. And this is the ultimate running around town parts grabber summertime ride. So I wanna get this thing on the road as soon as possible. So the first thing I wanna do here is start lightening the load. As I'm sure you saw, I had to push it into the shop here. This thing does run, but I had to push it in because in the last episode, we had to put this toe strap on here and pull start the thing because the Bendix quit working on the starter. So that starter is quite a pain to get out. But it looks like we're gonna be pulling it out for like the fourth time here. So one of the first things we're gonna do today is lighten the load a little bit. There's this big old honky tonk and snow plow hoist on the front of the Jeep here. And we're not gonna be plowing snow with this unit anymore. So we're gonna take that thing off of there. Uh, maybe if I found the appropriate winch to put on there, I would consider putting a winch on there. But uh, right now this is just extra weight we're toting around for no good reason. There we go. <laughs> All right, so before we go ripping the original radiator out, I guess we should unbox this one. I just got this off of Scamazon. It said it would fit, and it looked like it would fit in the pictures, but you know how that goes. All right, yeah, it, it actually does look like it's gonna fit. Got a nice aluminum radiator. Well, it was a fight like you wouldn't believe to get the hose clamp broke loose down there, but I got it. Now, going to attempt to try to catch the coolant that comes out of here, but I don't have great feelings about it. Oh yeah, this radiator is junk. Well, and the sucker's on there. Come on. Good gravy. Oh, the wire inside the neck. Pulled. I don't even know if I can reuse that now. All right. I think this thing is free. hoping we would be able to sneak this thing out without taking the fan shroud off but now it's looking like the fan shroud's got to go so six more screws and then we should be able to pull it out well, I've dealt with some old screws like this before that you think you're probably not going to get out of there but sometimes you get lucky if you use an impact with a nice fresh bit on it beat on them kind of slow at first you don't want to just go full ham yep, there's one they're just Stupid little sheet metal screws, but they can make your life miserable. It's so delaminated that I think I can get it out regardless. 
Yeah, the vent tube is the only thing even holding it on here now. Break that right off. Yeah, there we go. The core of the radiator is completely separated from the metal holding it. Maybe. That's lovely. Look at the big old mess that fell down out of there. All that junk was trapped inside that radiator. So we'll hit the inside of this grill with the compressed air real quick and then uh, hopefully drop the new radiator right in. Well in typical fashion here I'm having a peek through the old front grill and if you can see the fan belt there she's pretty dry rotted cracked up and whatnot so while the radiator's out, it's a really good convenient time to change that over. And also it's got the old generator on the side here rather than a modern alternator. And I'm giving half a thought to yanking that thing off there and just putting a 12 volt one wire alternator on there. I think I have one laying around here, so. Hmm. I guess I need to stop thinking in that outdoor work mentality and start thinking about it like I'm working in a nice enclosed shop and I was just about to feed her the beans and blow all this dust all over the place and then I remembered oh that'll make a big mess and you have a shop back sitting right there okay so as I believe I mentioned earlier in the video the starter Bendix was not engaging the flywheel when we would crank the starter. So I got it on, on the bench here. I didn't bother to record pulling it out because I think I've had this starter out in every single one of the videos about this Jeep. Um, it's not much to see, it's just a couple bolts. So anyways, we can give this thing a test run here and you can see what it's doing. Contact. As you may or may not be able to see there, the Bendix wheel is moving a little bit, but it's not moving right. When I got the starter out, it was slid back further, and I spun it a little bit by hand, and it kind of popped out. This is pretty much where I think it should be when it's actually starting the engine, and then after the engine takes off, it should retract, and it's not going back now. Uh, so it wasn't springing out on its own before, and now it won't go back. So we're going to take the starter apart. I did order a Bendix, we may or may not need it, but uh, it might just be some dirt built up inside of that mechanism there that's not letting it work correctly. More straight screwdriver stuff. Ode to joy. The armature and the commutator Commutator. I never know if I'm say that right, but anyway, they they look pretty good. All the windings and everything still look nice, so that's good. Oh yeah, look at all the junk come out of there. That could have bound our Bendix gear up. Let's clean this thing up and see what happens here. Well, that might have something to do with it. There's a roll pin here that retains the whole thing and it is pushed out and it's got shiny metal on it so it was interfering with something. Let's try and drive that back in and see what we get. Well, I think we got that part of it fixed up, but what's... It's still not retracting down as it should. I don't know how to fix that part. Well, I think I found the magic to disassemble this thing. There's a little snap ring here we gotta pop out of the groove. 
There we go. There we go. Look at that. Something happened. Snap ring. I've never actually taken one of these apart before. Oh yeah, she's all greased up. This thing is coated in just really sticky old grease. Look at that, the gear teeth were actually bound up with like compressed mouse house, keeping the teeth from sliding how they're supposed to. So that could have been part of our issue as well. There we go. Look at that, she slides in and out now. This spring doesn't like to spring them a thing very well inside of here because it's pretty tight tolerances and this sticky old grease is actually kind of making it bind up. Uh, what else do we have going on here? For some reason, this piece right here is what ultimately controls the gear sliding up and down. And this thing should ramp back down here to the bottom, but for some reason, it's not really wanting to do that. All right, so I had to throw this thing in the vise to get this started, but I got this locking ring coming off the top here. Got it covered up with my hands so that it doesn't go flying across the whole shop. That comes off, now that comes off, spring washer, and this thing should just ramp right out of here. Oh, spring-loaded dealio, ah, yeah, that's what's screwed up. So this little spring-loaded deal goes down inside of this guy. All right, so I think this little spring-loaded detent thing, um, well, I don't know how the heck it happens but I think it wound up on the wrong little track here. So you gotta start it out in the right spot. And then it should, yep, look at that. Winds all the way down. So I don't know what causes something like that to happen, but uh, that's how that's supposed to work. I bet you we put this thing back together, it works now. See what we got here, you ready? Contact. Yeah. Now that thing, uh, it isn't gonna return on its own right now because in operation, right in this position, it's engaged into the flywheel of the engine. So what happens is when the engine starts, it actually outspeeds the starter because you just took away the voltage from the starter. So the starter sits effectively, but the engine's still spinning, so it spins that thing and it uh, retracts itself back down in and away from the flywheel, but uh, it's working. Oh yeah. Yeah, I took the liberty of uh, lubing up all the spinning components as well, making sure we had some good fresh grease on everything because it was very, very dried out and sticky in there compared to what it should be. All right, does our starter magically work now? Well, I guess it's not magic if we fixed it. Does the starter work? Contact. Oh, buddy. Works perfectly. That is what I like to see. Might just go ahead and pull the whole generator, figure out exactly how hard it's gonna to be to switch this over to a single wire alternator. Come on. There we go. Yeah, the old belt. She's seen better days. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this generator off of here because while I was installing the starter, I noticed that the back of the generator here is open. Like I'm actually sticking the wrench inside the generator right now. And it looked like it's full of uh, debris and mouse house and Lord only knows what else. So if the generator works, it would probably greatly benefit from getting cleaned out. If not, then we can uh, see what it's gonna take to adapt an alternator to it, a modern alternator. Look at that. It's 
Look at all the goodies our furry little friends have drug in over the years. Got that vacuumed out. Come on, baby, you can do it. There we go. Look at all the nastiness coming out of there. Whew. Other than being dirty and rusted up a bit, it doesn't look bad at all. So I noticed that one side of the brushes moves freely like this, and that's necessary because it keeps tension against your commutator up here. This side here is not seized, but it doesn't slide like it's supposed to. I don't think it's keeping pressure like it needs to be. So it's a good thing we came in here and did this. There we go. A little bit of oil on there and she's back in business. Up here on the end of the commutator, one of the things I always do is I look for places like this where you got these bridges here. It's just I believe it's carbon from the brushes built up in there. If you take a nice fine hook like that, or a pick, you can sit here and scribe each one of these things out. And I'm not even going to pretend to tell you I know why you need to do that, but uh, I know that people have told me you're supposed to do that, so it's what I do. Somebody in the comments can probably tell me better why. Short of putting it in the lathe, I found the, uh, the best way to clean this stuff up is like this. Not going to get much better than that. Alright, let's reassemble this guy and then we can bench test it the same way we just cleaned it up and make sure that we're getting voltage out of it. Alright, so to test out your generator here, an easy way to do it, you hook up 12 volts to your armature side. There's two posts coming out here. One's your field, one's your armature. 12 volts to the armature side. Ground it out. And it should take off just like this. It'll start motoring. Seems to be motoring nice and strong, no trouble there. So it'll take a jumper wire from the ground up to your field and it should cut the speed way down but keep going. So that's your generator under full load and uh, it appears that we're working good. The belt's got some tension on it. The old fan guard is a very tight fit here on this radiator. moment of truth and find out if uh, we didn't poke a hole in this thing while we were installing it. I went down to the Napa to pick up some coolant as I usually do and uh, I came across the Rotella coolant. Now as you guys all know I'm a big big fan of uh, Rotella oils and I've never actually seen their coolant before so I started reading the bottle and uh, it sounds pretty darn good. It's this red stuff as a nitrate free extended life coolant and it's supposed to be good for like 120,000 miles, I think the back of the jug says. 
and it's a, it's a mixed use coolant, so it's good for gas engines, diesel engines, heavy trucks, uh, light duty stuff. It should work with just about everything. And uh, my fleet is definitely a mixed bag of nuts, so always good to have coolant that can mix and interchange with everything else. Getting messy, I should have got a funnel. Every 30 second job is one snapped bolt away from being an all day job. We had a little bit of leak down here around our gasket on this uh, thermostat neck and I tightened up the bolts and I got a good couple turns out of this guy and then, whoops. Uh, so now I gotta suck the coolant back down out of here a little bit and take that neck off of there and it looks like I'm gonna have to drill and hopefully easy out that bolt. All right, well I got that thing siphoned out. It's drawn itself down, so we get to save our coolant here and not make a big mess, hopefully. So I always get some comments here and there people that say that I use the impact too much and I'm gonna break things. Well, I will have you know that when I snapped this bolt, I was using this very ratchet. I was not using an impact and I broke it. You could say that at this point, I may have more finesse with an impact than I do a ratchet. But actually looking at the, the bolt here that snapped off, you can kind of see it's rusty all around the outside edge there. And that's not like a thread that's rusted over and the core was still good. I think that it was already had like a crack starting and just hadn't snapped off yet. Let's see what's behind door number one here. Well, I made it all the way through the bolt, so that's good. Here's the hope and it's not very stuck. Oh, look at that. It spins right out of there. Thank goodness. I was really worried that that sucker was going to be bottomed out in there and stuck. Ta-da! Look at that. Worked like a charm. All right, well, since we have the thermostat neck off, we'll just go ahead and dump some coolant straight into the block. That way we can reduce the chance of getting an air bubble in the system. Sidebar here, look how pitted and rotted out this thermostat neck is. And I've already tried to get one from the local parts store. They can't get it. I, they're available online, but uh, Probably take you a week to get one, and I'd like to drive this thing like today. So uh, here's what we're gonna do. We've got some epoxy mixed up here. And we're just gonna go ahead and slather a nice coat on here. I think I might have mixed up way too much. Doesn't look like we're gonna need nearly what I thought we would. And uh, this stuff is a fast cure. It says it's completely cured in 30 minutes, so I'll see you guys in 30 minutes. There we go. Uh, it's not good as new, but it's good enough for who it's for. Now, let's try to finish adding our coolant finally.
Of course, I had just shut the camera off when things went sideways here. Apparently, we had a big air bubble in the system, and when the thermostat finally opened, uh, we had a big boosh. <laughs> coolant. coolant went everywhere, as you can probably tell. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't have been so bad, except, you know, when it blows out of the radiator, it falls right down onto the fan, which just really flings her all over the place. So I got misted. Everything under the hood here got misted. But, uh, yeah, I think, I think we're still okay. I think we just need to add some more coolant now and uh, fire her back up. Making me really glad I invested in the floor scrubber. But uh, luckily we got the pig mats down here soaking up all that stuff. Shouldn't be too bad to clean it up. Anyway, let's fire this thing back up and uh, put some more coolant in it. You guys have heard me flog the benefits of Rotella in uh, plenty of videos past, but while I was picking up that coolant, I saw they're also running a, uh, a new promotion from now until the end of June. If you uh, buy three gallons of uh, Rotella T5 or T6 and upload your receipts to their website, they actually send you a uh, gift card. So I'll leave a link for that down in the description. It seems pretty easy and a good way to get a few bucks back on your next oil purchase. Alright, I saved a little bit of headroom for expansion in there because these older vehicles don't have uh, coolant expansion tanks on them. You can't fill it right up to the neck. But I feel pretty confident we have all the air out of the system. Time to see if our generator repair worked. Yeah, 12.6. Uh, let me try revving it up a little bit. Oh, look at that. <laughs> yeah, there we go. 13, 13.75. <laughs> Sweet success. Awesome. The charging system is now working. I think we are finally ready to take this thing for a drive. Every time we've tried to drive it before, it is overheated. Fingers crossed, today is going to be the day it does not. guys I love driving this thing temp gauge is working we're sitting right in the middle well just above just above the middle we should still be fine That was short lived. I don't know what's going on here. It's acting like we're out of fuel. But I know we're not because I just dumped five gallons in it. I don't know, it just acts like it's out of gas. I, I did dump, it wasn't five gallons, but at least a few gallons of fuel in here before we took off. And she hardly sips any. I'm sure this thing does pretty good on fuel. Up here we have a visible sight bowl on our fuel pump and I don't know if you guys can tell but it looks pretty darn low in there. It's usually pretty full up to the top so I'm confident it's a fuel issue. I don't know why we're not getting it to the pump. We rebuilt that pump in a previous episode so hopefully it's uh didn't quit pumping on us.
Well, I threw another five gallons of gas in it and we still weren't getting anything. But it must have just been a clogged fuel line because I pulled that fuel line off the pump and nothing was really coming out. And with, I don't know, about 10 gallons of gas in it at least, maybe more, it should have just been gravity flowing out and it wasn't. So I just took the old airline, blew the line back out to the tank, and uh, now we were getting fuel. So put the line back on, she fired right up. I guess it's time to try to take this thing for another spin and hopefully it stays running this time. Oh, and look at that. Since I put more fuel in it, the gauge came alive. Fuel gauge is reading three quarters of a tank. How about that? Oh yeah. Let's see if we can actually make it out of the driveway this time. died before. So with that, our overheating issue appears to be fixed. I ran it up and down the driveway quite a bit. Uh, I probably put a few miles on this thing just running back and forth in the driveway. And uh, no overheating, it never really got up much past halfway on the temp gauge. The temp gauge is functioning, so uh, pretty happy with that fix. So the next thing we need to do to get this thing barreling down the road again is to fix the brakes. Right now you can push that pedal as hard as you want to and ain't nothing gonna happen. That master cylinder is uh, rusted up solid. I'm sure all of the wheel cylinders are also in terrible shape. If we put fluid in them from sitting this long, I'm sure they're all gonna leak. So I just went ahead and bought an entire kit to redo the brakes here. So as you guys could probably see in the video of me driving this thing around, it is still smoking. An engine that's been sitting for a long time, oftentimes the piston rings will seize into the piston grooves allowing oil from the crankcase to come up into the combustion chamber and be burnt off, causing that white haze to fall year round. So yeah, because we're smoking, we are a bit low. It says we can add a quart. So I'm hoping that over time, the smoke will kind of cut down a little bit uh, because the more heat cycles we subject this engine to now, theoretically, the rings should kind of loosen up and uh, hopefully take up the slack. But I don't think we're ever going to get this thing back to zero smoke. Uh, anyway, due to the smoke, we are burning off a bit of oil, so we'll go ahead and top it up with the good stuff. You guys see me rescue a lot of stuff that's been neglected for a long time, usually. So, when it gets to me, I like to treat it right. I make sure I only buy the best oils we can get. Especially with a unit like this that could potentially leave us stranded on the side of the road. There we go. Back up to where it should be on the dipstick so we know we're good for at least a few more miles. Well, this ought to be a treat. So on uh, a little bit more modern vehicles, at this point you would be able to actually just 
pull the entire uh, brake drum off of there. That's not the case for uh, this old guy. Things got to be done a little bit differently. Pull this axle nut cover off here first. Now we got to remove the castle nut, which is held on by a, uh, a pin there. Usually, those are really stuck on there and you got to use a hub puller like this to pull that off of there. And I am not believing what I'm seeing. These brakes look brand new. I bought a whole new brake kit to, to get this thing going again because I just thought for sure these brakes are going to be cooked. When I popped the wheel off there, I did notice we still have some black paint uh, where the the wheel covers up the hub I thought well that's pretty strange that that paint's still you know paint and not rust like the rest of this thing and uh, apparently that was an indicator that these brakes were fresh I'm still quite a bit leery of these wheel cylinders since they've been sitting for so long with no oil in them but um, well worst case scenario I do have wheel cylinders but before we even bother to change anything we might as well give them a shot they're probably pretty fresh the rubber on you know the, the ends here still pretty pliable it doesn't feel like it's dry rotted or anything it's still nice and flexible I don't know I'm feeling pretty confident actually there we go that's how that's supposed to work and yeah that's fantastic news we have the same scenario over here on this side the brake drum looks basically brand new no ridge in it whatsoever. Same can be said for the shoes. They're not worn out at all. They look great. All the springs are still good. Rubber still pliable on that master cylinder. I'm not afraid of this. We the worst case scenario here is that we bleed the whole system out, get these brakes functioning, and the wheel cylinders start leaking. Uh, and that would be a bummer. Have to rip this back apart, but at the end of the day, really not that huge of a deal. I do have the wheel cylinders. I have the whole brake kit sitting here now. And... Uh, would appear I bought it for nothing. Right away I'm saying the same hallmarks as the uh, the rear wheels. We got nice looking painted drum underneath where the wheel rides. whole hub assembly comes off like that all right it's probably gonna be pretty tough for you guys to see but our axle nut here is not retained with a cotter pin like the rear axles so there's a lock washer underneath of this nut and then uh, when they got the nut to the torque that they liked then they bend over the end of the washer and fold it up along a flat on the nut and that retains the nut from going anywhere so just have to bend that back down probably have to hit it with a hammer a bit and then we can take this nut off all right so this nut actually is what sets the preload on the wheel bearing here so we have to make sure that we get this back installed properly All right, so it definitely still doesn't look bad under here by any stretch. These brake shoes are very, very new as well. Um, but we've already had a failure over here. I'm gonna guess what happened there is that uh, these brakes were actually stuck on whenever I first got this thing going, or maybe even before that. When I drug it out of the barn, uh, the brakes could have been stuck on. And in fact, that, that's kind of starting to ring a bell, I think. So 
what probably happened is uh, me dragging it around here at the farm and once I got it running and driving that hunk of brake shoe that was stuck to the drum probably yanked off of there as you can see and uh, well it's gone now it uh, it got ate up into a thousand pieces and uh, she's just gone so I guess for this front wheel I'm gonna go ahead and replace that I'm gonna put new new shoes on and we're gonna have a good look at that wheel cylinder before we close this up as well we're just gonna go ahead and replace this wheel cylinder since we already have it apart I should have the new soft line that goes over to the wheel cylinder as well so we're already gonna be fiddling around taking that off the back all we'll have is two bolts and switch that out since we're in here already and it looks like either this axle seal leaked at one time and it's been repaired and not cleaned up great or is still leaking uh, I'm gonna investigate that a little bit but we're gonna clean up this backing plate real good before we reassemble everything because all this lingering grease in here um, if this drum gets nice and hot if we're riding the brakes down a big grade or something that heat transfers into all this grease and oil and next thing you know you have oil residue running out the bottom and it's getting in your drum and screwing up your brakes so I tried to loosen the other end of the, the soft brake line there and can you see what happened? It just sheared, just sheared that steel line right off. And the, I mean, they're, they're rusty, but they honestly didn't look terrible. I, I wasn't sure if we'd be able to save them, but I was, I was hoping. Got our new wheel cylinder going in here. Nice new soft line here. I haven't done drum brakes in a long time and I am not complaining about it. I'm not a big fan. I also know that I have the proper tool for doing these retaining springs, yet I can't manage to find it anywhere. So needle nose pliers identify as the proper tool today. Come on, go in there, go to your home, go to your home spring. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, got our new soft line connected up to this nice new hard line. And I decided I wasn't going to put this thing all back together with that uh, questionable seal in there, so I had to run out. Picked up two new seals. I'll do this one and the passenger side. And uh, yeah, swap that out and slap this back together. Well, they made their seals pretty tough back in the day. That sucker was in there. That ought to be plenty. Inner washer followed by inner nut. All right, now to set this bearing preload, we actually need the wheel on. According to the manual, you're supposed to have the wheel on and barely have any perceptible uh, up and down travel in the bearing and then install your lock nut and washer. So we're going to hold off on that step until we have the brakes all bled because I don't want to put the wheel in here and just get in the way of the bleeder.
I'm glad we pulled it. Uh, yep, same thing on this side as what happened on the other side. See that? Chunks of brake shoe. Again, they're they're like brand new, but they just seized to the drum and uh, yeah, they came apart. Alrighty, I was able to get the front end back together here. I ended up putting a new hard line from this T-block here to both front wheels. Both of them were rotted off and uh, almost had an accident here. I've never, ever had anything like this occur and I don't understand why. I've, I don't understand why this happened. I'm still sitting here scratching my head an hour later, but uh, I was heating up this fitting, trying to remove it. You know, this is the hard line coming in on the left here, and then this is the what's left of the soft line coming out. And as you can see, this is the soft line that was in there. It blew apart. I was heating it up with just a little propane torch. There was no fluid in it. It was bone dry, and the end of the line was even cut, so there was no pressure building up in it. I can't figure out for the life of me what happened, but all of a sudden, kaboom, and it was about like a gunshot went off in my ear, and... Uh, this piece of rubber hose went flying across the shop. I was laying directly underneath of it, luckily. If I'd have been working on it, sitting here like I am right now, it would have hit me in the chest. I don't know that it would have hurt me, but uh, man, scared the crap out of me. You never expect something like that. The wheels are all taken care of. We have the master cylinder tucked way down in there. It looks like it's gonna be a fun job, but uh, we're gonna pull that master cylinder out. There is an access panel here through the floor, but. Not a lot of room to work in there either. But anyway, we've got to pull that master cylinder out because it is rusted up solid and we're going to replace it with a new one. Well, it broke loose, I think. It's turning at least. Finally, stupid plate. The camera died, so you guys didn't get to see it, but uh, managed to finally get the stupid thing out of there. <laughs> it was uh, it was quite a fight. Ooh. I was always taught you're supposed to bench bleed these master cylinders first. Just fill it up with fluid. Take your plug out of the end there and just slowly push it. And you'll be getting all kind of air bubbles up here in your reservoir. You don't even have to push it all the way. You just a little bit. And you should start getting fluid out the end there. I have a bucket down there to catch it. There we go. Once you quit getting air bubbles out, put your plug back in, put your cap on, you're ready to install it. So we got the master cylinder on. I changed uh, like almost all the brake lines in the process of bleeding the brakes. And uh, I spared you guys the boredom of watching that debacle. But 
we got the tire mounted back up on here so now we can check the preload on this front axle bearing and basically with the tire mounted on there you should be able to shake it and according to the manual you should barely be able to perceive any slop uh, kind of up and down slop and me I can kind of also hear like the grease popping just a little bit in the bearing as I do this so yeah we got just a teeniest little bit of wiggle play on it so we should be pretty good there so you got a locking washer here and it's got a tab that engages with a slot in the axle hub here spindle hub I guess it is technically and you got your locking nut that's got 65 years of farmer chisel marks on the edges of it from tensioning it so we'll just continue the tradition All right, so if you're one of them high and fancy types, you have the proper axle nut socket that is deep enough to clear your stub shaft sticking out there, but I'm not one of those people, and somebody's already done this 20 times, so. You just take your screwdriver, you drive that thing around till it tensions. You find a fresh place on your lock washer and pry that baby up into the side of the nut, keep it from going anywhere. You guys want to see something really cool? Hit it. Oh, we got brakes. started working. We just took this thing for its first maiden voyage down the road because we actually have some brakes and uh, wasn't afraid to do it this time. A little dark so you guys couldn't see much, but it went well. So we are one crucial step much, much closer to this thing being completely road legal, which is the ultimate goal here. Um, one thing I noticed working on it in the shop here, it's like the first time I've actually had it on hard concrete. It leans to the driver's side quite a bit. And I did some investigating. There's a cracked spring over here. And there's another cracked spring right down there. So I guess in the next video, you're gonna be seeing this thing all the way around because uh, it's a pretty bumpy ride. The shocks, they're a little past their prime. So it's, a, it's definitely could use some shocks anyways. So we might as well get a complete suspension overhaul kit for all new leafs on it, all new shocks. And uh, we'll know that this thing is truly safe for the road. Uh, broken springs are nothing to play with. I've, I've had a few run-ins with those in the past, so kind of learned my lessons there, and uh, we'll go ahead and get this thing fixed up, make it safe for the wife. She, she wants to learn how to drive this thing, so better not make it janky like everything I'm used to running. So anyways, guys, I think that's all I got for today. This video is probably getting a little bit too long. 
we got some more work left to do on the Jeep, but very, very soon we're going to be driving this thing down the road and enjoying it. I think it's going to make its maiden voyage up to the steam show, which is coming up very soon here. What are the dates, Roman? May 20th and 21st. May 20th and 21st, the Brownsville National Pike Steam Show. So I've covered the steam show several times on the channel. I always go up there and I have a great time. That's where one of my cable shovels is at. The old CJ5 is going to be up there and uh, maybe Christine if she decides to play nice. If you guys are interested, I'll be up there for the whole weekend. So come on up, say hi, and check out some of the old equipment. And Anyways, guys, that's all for now. If you liked the video, do me a big favor. Hit that thumbs up button down below. It really helps out the channel. It doesn't cost you guys a dime. If you're interested in helping support the channel a little more directly, you can head on over to the store at dieselcreek.com. Pick yourself up some sweet swag over there. we got hats, t-shirts, koozies, beer, beer koozies, stickers, the whole nine yards over there at dieselcreek.com. The link is down in the description. But that's all for now, so thanks for watching, and I will see you on the next one. Later. Mm -hmm.